Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single episode and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace. I'm Carrie Lee, Chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy and Director of the Civil Military Relations Center here at the U.S. Army War College. On August 30th, 2023, just hours after Gabon's longtime authoritarian leader Ali Bongo declared victory in an election marred by fraud and irregularities, Brigadier General Bryce Olegi Ngema led a military coup d'état to depose the government of Gabon. The coup, which successfully resulted in the retirement of Bongo, came just a month after a successful coup in Niger deposed democratically elected President Mohamed Bazoum and was by some counts the ninth successful coup d'etat in Africa since 2020. Indeed, by the numbers, Africa leads every other region in coup attempts since 1950 with 220, almost half of which have been successful. The recent spate of coups across the continent, along with the reemergence of the military junta in Myanmar after its democratic transition, have long-lasting implications for U.S. foreign policy. In many cases, military assistance and aid is tied to democratic governance and could deprive countries of security assistance. In other cases, military regimes may be more or less friendly with the United States than their predecessors and lead to geopolitical realignments across the continent. And there are regularly accusations that U.S. security assistance in the form of weapons, training, and, yes, professional military education ultimately make coups more likely and more effective. Yet, one of the central principles of civil military relations in the United States, and in many if not most of its partners and allies, is the concept of a democratic ethos and civilian control of the military. So why do military leaders launch coups d'etat? And how do they ensure that those efforts will be successful? What are the implications of coups for democracy abroad? And how can officers protect civilian control in the face of democratic backsliding across the globe? Here to discuss these questions and others is Dr. Nanahal Singh. Dr. Singh is an associate professor of national security affairs at the Naval War College and a scholar of African politics, civil military relations, and most importantly for our purposes, is the author of Seizing Power, the Strategic Logic of Military Coups, which is a book on the dynamics and outcomes of military coups based on 300 hours of interviews and a statistical analysis of 471 coup attempts. Dr. Singh holds a B.S. from Yale University and a Ph.D. in political science from Harvard University. Dr. Singh, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So I actually want to start. uh, Tell us a little bit about your background, because as I understand it, your trip into political science, your pathway into this discipline is a little less straightforward than many of us who kind of go to undergrad, decide that they want to do a Ph.D., then go to graduate school, et cetera. You took a break and did some really interesting things in the meantime. So why go back to school for politics? So when I was an undergrad, I double majored. I took classes in poli sci and then like they tell you to do as a liberal arts student, you should explore. I started taking classes in computer science. And I took one and I took another and I took another. And my dad said, look, um, this was a recession. He said, if you're going to do this much, why don't you keep going till you get your degree? So I finished up a degree in computer science and I got scouted and recruited and I got a job offer and I moved off to Silicon Valley in the days even before the internet. And oddly enough, my first project was actually a project for the Navy. But back then, I I didn't really know very much about the U.S. military. And I spent two years at Oracle as a programmer. But I spent a lot of my time reading stuff about the news. And back then, Silicon Valley was a little bit less exciting. It wasn't – there was a lot of maintenance of big existing structures – but they weren't producing a ton of new, exciting apps and features. And I got bored and I injured my hands from overwork. So I took some time off. I came back to New York. I started working at 
Human Rights Watch. I did an internship at Human Rights Watch, and I was applying to master's programs in public policy. And I went and I spoke to a professor at Columbia who listened to me speak and said, you know what? Why do you want to waste your money? Go into a PhD program, take your master's, and leave, and that way you won't pay any tuition. So I just applied around and got lucky, got into a PhD program at Harvard, and then kept going. Um, and it's weird the way a lot of these things are things where, at the time, you do your best to kind of think them out, but you never really understand where they're going to take you. And I never thought I would end up teaching at Notre Dame, and then from there going to Alabama to teach at the Air War College, and then now to the Naval War College. Like, all of this was a, a matter of doing my best to plan, but a good deal of happenstance and, and luck. So once you get into graduate school, um, first of all, I'm not going to ask the name of the professor who told you to go into the PhD program and then like cut bait and run, right? <laughs> Um, but what made you first decide to stay? And then why study military coups? That wasn't a terribly popular thing to study at the at the time. So I did find graduate school really intensely rewarding. And as soon as I was there, I was interested in continuing. I wasn't sure when I first got there whether I wanted to be an academic or do things that were policy related, but you very quickly drink the Kool-Aid and you think, oh, this is what I want to do, which is why it's ironic that, in fact, I'm not in a civilian, you know, PhD granting institution now. But the civil military relations story is, again, a story which is sort of accidental. Um, when I was an undergrad, as a sophomore, first semester, sophomore year, I was looking at the course catalog and I saw a class on civil military relations. And it was Ooh, a taught by who? It was a it was taught by a grad student named Maria Moyano, who is Argentine, and was very colorful Argentine, big personality. You know, back when graduate students were still chain smoking, kind of thing. <laughs> and it was a grad class, but I talked my way into it. And to her credit, Maria Moyano was like, "Sure, sophomore, if you can keep up, come into my class." So I took the class, and I remember thinking. This is interesting, but I don't buy a lot of it. So I thought it was important. And a lot of it was Latin America focused. But I didn't actually find the explanations all that satisfactory. Okay, so fast forward to graduate school. And I'm in a uh, quantitative methods class. And I need something to write a paper on. And I read this paper where they're number crunching on coups. So I start playing around with that. And again, I'm reminded of my dissatisfaction. And I get attracted to the question of coups because it, it goes like this. I was interested in democracy. I was interested in development. I was interested in conflict. And it seemed that all of these things all revolved around questions of the military, particularly in, in developing countries. Um, and so if you were going to have a democracy, what's the major threat to democracies? Well, it's coups if you're interested in conflict. And at that time, there was a lot of literature on ethnic conflict. Well, one question was, what was the government doing? Were they encouraging one side or were they providing peace and security? And so it felt like there was a big hole here. And I started reading stuff and I got dissatisfied and I didn't like any of the answers. And I was overconfident about my ability to dig in. And you just sort of back into something step by step by step. And next thing you know, you've got a one-year pre-dissertation fellowship to go to Ghana and take classes on, on African history and African politics and start to um, do preliminary dissertation research, except the university's on strike. And I end up doing a whole bunch of directed readings, and I start poking around. And next thing I know, I do sort of three quarters of my case study in that year because of the way that one thing led to another. And at the time, I was optimistic and perhaps foolish enough to think, oh, you study the topic for five or six years and you keep going. And I didn't understand that the first thing you write on is going to stay with you for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wasn't thinking, oh, what's a topic I want to write about for a very long time? It was, 
where does my intellectual curiosity lead me? And sometimes you follow your nose. And following your nose is a good way to do things in that your instincts are often a lot better than your planning mind are, is. Like, at the time, I was told by a very senior Harvard professor, okay, I'll, I'll name him, by Bob Putnam, don't study coups. There's nothing to be done which is interesting here. <laughs> and so I thought, well, it's interesting historically speaking, and it's interesting to me, and I think I can make the case for it. So I kept I kept going, but I never thought I would end up doing the things I did. And I, I really did think, for example, that I would go to Ghana and I would find some newspaper accounts and a whole bunch of people's diaries, and I would end up with more material which could help me understand what had actually happened and sort through some of these theories. I didn't think... A, that I'd end up doing a ton of oral history, and B, that in fact I would end up trying to articulate what my, what my, the people I was speaking to were telling me, trying to put it together and articulate it in such a way that it ended up building a very different argument and approach. So I want to get back to the oral history uh, in, in a little bit, but let's go to kind of some basics first. Because I tend to think that uh, we use this term coup and coup d'etat like very loosely or very loosely around the ether and, oh, this is a coup and that is a coup. How do you define what a coup d'etat is? So I work with military coups and I think of this as something which has to be explicit, something that has to involve some portion of the military, the police or security forces – and it has to be undertaken with the intent to overthrow the government. So people use the term coup much more broadly. They'll talk about civilian coups or constitutional coups. They will throw in popular uprisings, which have no security involvement. They will throw in assassinations or invasions. But I tend to use the term very much more narrowly to talk about when it is that actors within the military are acting to overthrow the government in some way. So why is it important to have specificity around how we kind of determine this, the use of this term? I'm picky about this not to be pedantic, but because I think that the dynamics are very different when you're talking about activity that involves people with guns. So you have people who are specialists in the use of violence. And that's very different. And particularly when they're part of the state, it's very different from what happens when you've got an invasion by mercenaries or you've got a rabble or you've got an insurrection. The dynamics of each of these things are different. And so I, I want to talk about it in a specific way because I think that those other things are interesting too, but they operate differently from the thing we're talking about. Much in the same way that, you know, if you're talking about football, it's different from rugby, American football, and it's different from soccer. And there are similarities, but, you know, strategy and understanding football is not the same thing as understanding rugby. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I oftentimes when we're exploring why you care about civil military relations, right? Why is the military as an institution differently? And everybody kind of looks because we're nonpartisan because X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, because you're the guys with the guns. Like this is this is why, right? We care about civil military relations instead of civil EPA relations. Um, OK, so in the book, you argue that coups are essentially a coordination game between military actors, and you use a model from game theory in order to explain when they are and are not successful. Um, what do you mean by that, that it's a coordination game? So let me take a step back and um, tell you a, a story. One of the questions I had when I started all of this is I was interested in seeing how people reacted when a coup started. Because when a, a, a coup usually involves a small number of people. And the outcome of the coup is determined by how the rest of the military responds. So each time I interviewed a military officer who was in command of some important unit within the military, I would ask them, 
one question. When you first heard that a coup started, what did you do and why? How did you choose which side to support? Mm. And I figured they were going to tell me, oh, I thought the government was legitimate or illegitimate. I didn't like how they were treating the military. But instead, I heard something like this. When the coup attempt started, I had to put aside my feelings for or against the government and think about how best to act. I didn't want to lead my men into a situation where they might be hurt or killed, nor did I want to plunge the country into civil war. And, and one actual quote I had was, one wants to avoid unnecessary bloodshed and destruction. This is why one waits for consensus. And so the story that they were telling me was something that game theorists call a coordination game, which is to say, it's a situation where you've got two different outcomes. Do you support the coup makers or do you support the incumbent government? And some people support one side or some people would prefer one thing to happen. Some people would support another thing to happen. But what they want most of all is for the whole situation to be resolved as quickly and peacefully as possible because there is a very big risk for what happens if there's a lack of coordination and what can happen if a coup isn't resolved quickly and peacefully is it can spiral out. You can have fratricide, you can have institutional damage, you can have a large number of people dying. And in worst case scenario, you can have a civil war like the Spanish Civil War is what happened when the coup, when the coup in Spain did not resolve and the two factions kept fighting and fighting and fighting over an extended period of time. Also, selfishly, individuals don't want to back the side that's going to lose and be penalized for it. Right. So in situations like that, there is an intense pressure to coordinate. And this works. So this is uh, what game theorists call a coordination game. It also works very well within the military because military personnel are trained to work together. One of the first things that people learn when they are, for example, newly minted privates is it is very dangerous to act in ways that that are not coordinated with your fellow soldiers. But if you work together, you are much stronger. The strength of the military comes from coordinated, coherent action. Mm -hmm. And so these were the pressures they were under. And a coordination game isn't something which is obscure. In fact, revolutions work the same way. And bank runs and uh, financial crises work the same way, which is to say, at the end of the day, what you have is people will decide that they're going to back the side that everyone else is going to back. And so the outcome and the dynamics get shaped through the manipulation of information and expectations. You want to create the appearance that your desired outcome is a fait accompli. This bank is going under. Oh, well, I don't think it's going under, but if it's going under, I should pull my money out. Well, I didn't think it was going, going to go under, but if everyone else thinks it is, then I should pull my money out. And if you do that, those expectations will form a self-fulfilling prophecy. And in fact, the bank will go under. So for a senior military leader, if, you know, the the leaders of the coup take control of the information stations and say, this has happened and it is over, then everybody else has an incentive to get on board with the program. That's right. And so there are factors which contribute to whether or not you will be effective at doing that. Half of all coups fail. So it isn't as easy as simply, hey, I'm going to try to make a coup and I'm going to succeed. But what you do is you work with the situation that you're in. So history matters. If you've had past successful coups, it makes it more likely that people will assume that your coup will succeed. Mm -hmm. You need to grab control of a radio or television station usually, although sometimes coups happen in meetings, particularly if they're by senior officers. You use your broadcast, either the meeting or the radio or television broadcast, to make a fact to say, we have already won. Um, please put down your arms. We don't want to see any further chaos and bloodshed. We don't want to hurt anyone. Please stay where you are. The new government is going to be in power. You see symbolic targets like the parliament building and the president's house, which don't have any tactical value. And this is how it works in the abstract. And then on top of that, depending on who it is 
who's trying to make a coup if you are a sergeant or if you are a colonel or if you're a general, you have different resources that you can use to do this. And that creates different kinds of dynamics, which then shape how long it will take before a coup resolves itself, how peaceful or bloody it is, and how likely you are to succeed. So this is a really interesting part of the book that I find fascinating, because we typically think of coups as being led by like top generals who are super dissatisfied with the president's policies, or maybe they have personal incentives to want the guy gone. Um, but that's not always the case. And I'm thinking in particular, some of the more famous coups, like Gaddafi taking over in Libya, or Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, um, were led by like colonels, um, which, you know, we're here at the War College, we're teaching lieutenant colonels and colonels, these are, this is a demographic that's important to us. Um, so how do the dynamics of coups change when they aren't led by your four-star equivalent, you know, head of the security forces, but instead more closer to rank and file or mid-grade officers? So if you're a general, you have a good deal more information than anyone else does, and you can manipulate expectations. So that gives you the greatest likelihood of success. Um, and in fact, when I crunch the numbers, statistically speaking, um, a coup from the top succeeds around two-thirds of the time. A coup from the middle, let's say, by lieutenant colonels or colonels, succeeds around 40% of the time. And a coup from the bottom is something like 27 28% of, of the time. Low probability of it. Mm -hmm. But if you are a colonel, you are in direct control over fighting forces. And sure, a general can pick up the phone and tell you what to do, but you don't have to listen to that. You are the person who is in charge of the organic unit, and so you can move it where you want. So when a colonel tries to make a coup, that tends to be the coups where you see tanks in the street and sometimes a little bit more in the way of a show of force. And then what gets really interesting is when it's a coup from the bottom, either by a low-ranking military officer like a captain or a lieutenant or by a senior enlisted, and those tend to be mutinies. Gaddafi was actually a captain at that time, and he um, used a good deal of misinformation because there was a coup that was likely to happen by someone who was a lot more senior, and the captains pretended that, in fact, their coup was the coup by the more senior people, and people said, oh, we don't want to oppose these guys because they control the whole military. It wasn't until a month later that they revealed that they were a bunch of captains. But oh, that that's point, like Inception coup style. They had they had <laughs> consolidated power. It was really, really clever. Um, now, if you're leading a coup from the bottom, you have much more in the way of obstacles because you not only have to overthrow the incumbent, but you are challenging the entire military structure. Right. And you are turning it upside down. So it's a revolution within the military. And the way this works is it's often a good deal bloodier. It looks like a revolution, and there's a good deal more use of violence. It takes a lot longer to try to convince everyone that, in fact, these captains or sergeants are, in fact, in charge of everything, and it's a good deal more dangerous. And those are feel and look like revolutions, and oftentimes they call themselves revolutions. Probably the most consequential one of these was the Carnation Revolution in Portugal, which leads to the end of the military dictatorship in Portugal, but also the end of Portugal's overseas empire. Hmm. And this was a bunch of low-ranking officers and enlisted who were fed up with the Portuguese empire and fed up with fighting these wars to defend the empire. And so they planned to overthrow the military government. And that led to the second wave of democratization, which then spreads across Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking it's coups and revolutions led by captains. Um, you know, we teach strategic leadership here at the War College, right? And thinking about how to lead large groups of individuals, you put captains all of a sudden in charge of a country. What does governance look like in the aftermath of one of these kind of revolutionary coups? I don't know if, the, if this is beyond the scope of what you've looked at, but I, I'm just having this thought that... Surely, surely there's some lessons that need to be learned when you're rising from an 03 level to now going and being head of the country. 
So it's not something I've looked at systematically, but let me give you a general answer. There are two ways in which this can go. Sometimes someone will pick a mid to senior officer and put them in charge as a figurehead so that they can try to reimpose order and have someone who's going to sort of be the public face of the military, okay. uh, of, of the junta. But more often what they're doing is engaging in a broad rejection of the previous order. And so it will be revolutionary. And so the Portuguese government was a military government and it was conservative. And they are overthrown by young people who want to create democracy. Um, and so it looks a lot more inclusive and it looks a lot more like a revolutionary government. They tend to be um, either more inclusive across the military and sometimes more inclusive into civilians, depending on the context. The other thing that happens is sometimes they will engage in investigation of previous military leaders. And so sometimes this will lead, lead to trials of senior officers and even in a couple of cases, executions of those officers. So this is a, a great segue into, you know, launching a military coup is a dangerous exercise. Uh, it's very fraught. A lot of coup conspirators are executed, or if you are the victim of a coup, you are then also, you know, either forcibly put into retirement or exile or in extreme cases also um, you know, executed. Your methodology is an oral history. It's 300 hours of interviews. How do you get people to agree to sit down with you and discuss their designs on coups? And uh, how forthcoming are they on such a sensitive and like obviously fraught topic? It was a combination of three things. One was a good deal of help. I was assisted by some people within the country who are really experts in civil military relations and who lent me support, as well as retired senior officers who supported what I was doing and encouraged me and vouched for me. Secondly, was a good deal of luck. So the time when I was doing this in Ghana was the end of it. So Jerry Rawlings had seized power by coup and then he was elected twice, and it was the end of the Rawlings era, and we were moving towards a period of time where it would be more solidly democratic. And these were people who, um, within the military, there was a good deal of discussion about what this would look like. So someone, there was a window of time, and I didn't know this, where people would talk to me, and I happened to be there then. In fact, when I came back a year later, to do some roundup interviews, just finish things up, people said, it's a good thing we know you because right now, if you'd shown up, I wouldn't talk to you. And honestly, I don't feel very comfortable talking to you. So unfortunately, it would be very hard for someone else to step in and do the same thing. Yeah. The third thing was a good deal of hustle. So I did a snowball sample. Um, I was out there for a year. I had the support of Professor Abel Hutchfall, who is an expert on Ghanaian civil military relations. I helped his think tank, and he introduced me to a few people and saw what, what would happen. I'm also, my parents emigrated from India, and so people saw me and they saw my face, and a lot of them had trained in India, and that opened up doors between being a graduate student from Harvard and people knew what Harvard was, being an Indian-American and then this is where the hustle mattered. There was a good deal of trust building. I did three two-hour interviews, and the first one was really a good deal of trust building. I, by the way, I didn't say, hey, I'm in here trying to figure out how to make coup succeed or fail. I said, I'm interested in the history of Ghanaian civil military relations. Okay. And I want you to tell me your piece of this history. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did to create some some understanding and some sympathy, was to say, I don't know any of the answers. You guys know a lot more, and what I've read in books doesn't feel like it's right. So can you tell me what I need to understand? And then they probed me and tested me. They wanted to know, um, was I trustworthy? Did I have an axe to grind? Um, 
Did I have a political affiliation? It helped that I was an outsider, mm -hmm. actually. And they, they also asked a whole bunch of other questions. How did I like the country? How did I like the food? What had I eaten recently? It helped that I wore Ghanaian clothing and that I loved Ghanaian food. Um, they basically were testing me to see if I was racist, if I was going to listen as like someone who's sympathetic, or if I was going to be um, try to think that I was better than them. Mm -hmm. And so there was a good deal of demonstrating respect and listening sincerely um, and showing deference. Uh, and so one two-hour interview went by, and then people would say, you know, I didn't really want to talk to you, but you're okay. Come back in and ask me some more questions. You were all, you were doing your own civil military trust building exercise yeah. and dialogue. And and it helped that a lot of this was happened at the retired officers club. Uh -huh. I, I and I was in there. You know, they were hanging out. They were chilling. We had some some drinks and some food. Um, this at the time I didn't have to clear an IRB for this, but the use of alcohol probably would have gotten me into trouble. I was but gonna say, like, I would love to see an IRB for for these types of interviews. They were just sitting there hanging out and they're like, okay, go ahead and ask me some questions. And I made it very clear that I would just ask them things and they could revoke anything they wanted. And in the end, I kept checking with them. In the end, the stuff they wanted cut was usually remarks of a personal nature. Oh, at the time I was dating so-and-so when the coup <laughs> happened. Hey, could you cut that? My wife doesn't know that I dated her, right? And I was like, sure, no problem. Or a remark about, oh, yeah, my the woman who I married and I, we'd snuck away to get away from our parents. Oh, could you cut that? Because, you know, now we're elders in the church and we don't really... No problem. I'm happy to cut any of this stuff. What I wanted were their insights and... People, people gave them to me, but it was it was a combination of of those three things, and it, probably in that order, their willingness to help me, a good deal of luck, and the fact that I put in a lot of hours. It took me around nine months. The first nine months, I did maybe ten to twenty percent of the interviews. It took a long time to build trust, mm -hmm. and then it picked up. Yeah. What's one of the more surprising stories that you got from one of these interviews? Um, in the very first coup, and this doesn't actually make it into my book, this is the overthrow of President Nkrumah. I got to interview the guy who is the head of his presidential guard, and he'd never spoken to a researcher before. Wow. And he came down from his farm where he'd retired just to talk to me. This is, again, a sign of how much people helped me out. And um, he told me about what had happened that day, but I'd also spoken to his XO, and I got to compare their two stories. Uh -huh. And it turned out that one of the things the XO told me was that they did not want to fight with their counterparts outside. They were defending an empty house. The president was out of the country. And... Um, even though in the history books it was written as a heated battle, what I was told by people who were involved is that both sides were firing in the air. And then the XO told me, he said, honestly, we stuffed our ammunition in the toilet. And then we went to our boss and we told him, we ran out of ammunition. We can't fight anymore. We have to surrender. And then this guy who was head of the presidential guard said, I was prepared to keep defending the building even though it was empty. But... You know, I was told we run out of ammunition. And so I thought, okay, we're going to surrender. And so I got to stitch the stories together. <laughs> and one of the reasons why people talked to me was that, in fact, I could then tell them in a cleaned up, sanitized version, the synthesis of all of the other pieces because people had not spoken to each other. Sure. Here's, here's where you fit into this broader story. That's right. really interesting. It's all just information management. Yeah. And the deepest insights here all came from my interview subjects. So the bit about it being a coordination game came from a guy who was the head of a different head of a presidential guard. And so I asked him, you know, I was trying to understand why is it that the radio broadcast matters? Like if a coup is like a battle, you want to take over and then afterwards you announce we've succeeded. Right. Why are you taking this over first? Why does it matter? 
And I and I was curious as to what they said. So I said, do you get up there and is it like a pledge drive where you say, we can win, but only with your support, <laughs> right? right? And, and that's what you would expect if it was a prisoner's dilemma. We need everyone to join in. We don't want any free riders. And he looked at me like I was crazy and said, if I did that, everyone would say, boy, they're doomed to lose. I'm not going to support them at all if they need me. Uh-huh. So I said, what do you say? He said, well, what I said was... We've already taken over. He says, well, no, in this case, it was he was defending the regime. He said, we've got him on the run. He says, we didn't have him on the run. He says, it was me and three other guys who grabbed control over the radio station. But we acted like we had we had taken control back from the coup makers. And sure enough, by acting like it, we made it so. And he was the one who gave me a number of the key insights between him and a number of other people. And... It was just a matter of listening to what people had to tell you. Sure. I don't mean to be glib, but it's like the fake it till you make it theory of coup d'etat. Right. Right. And and then you start thinking about it and you realize revolutions are often the same way. And what is money? Money is about a social understanding about what are the things that have value and how, you know, what are we going to accept? Like a piece of paper doesn't mean anything, right? Confederate money doesn't mean anything. Uh, a greenback is worth something only because it's backed by not by the by gold in the Federal Reserve anymore, but by a set of social understandings. And so thinking about the way in which economics and military power and political power are all about people agreeing on how they are going to work together worked really usefully for me. So the book focuses on historical case studies in Ghana predominantly, but then also a case study on the Soviet Union and the attempted coup uh, towards the end of the Soviet Union, 1991, 1992 time frame. Uh, but it doesn't look like coups are going out of style anytime soon since, you know, it's, as I mentioned in the opening, we've had nine successful coups by some count in Africa since 2020, transition to the, uh, the reemergence of the military junta in Myanmar. I was looking and doing a little bit of research and prep for this, you know, it looks like a couple of dozen coup attempts just in the last several years across Africa and other places. You know, how should we understand this continued attractiveness, if you will, um, of, you know, the prospect of doing a coup d'etat? And, you know, the kind of recent spate of, of lots of coups and coups attempts, coup attempts, particularly in Africa. So, I think that there's always a theoretical vulnerability in any country, no matter how consolidated the democracy, no matter how consolidated the civil military relations to a coup. But the risk is always greater in countries which have a history of coups. So Sudan has a long history of coups. And sure enough, they had another one, which turns into a civil war. Yeah. And even if in Gabon they hadn't had a coup recently, they had a military that always had outsized importance. So the way I understand it is that there's always a risk of coups, but that coup makers are engaging in a calculus. And they're thinking not just about succeeding in taking power, but what happens afterwards. And there's a period of time after the Cold War where coups go down because there's a very strong international norm against coup making. And if you violate that norm, you get punished. The U.S. will yank support from you. The IMF will yank support from you. Europe will yank support from you. Economic support, you will be cut out of all international bodies. And you will be isolated. And, and that's it. And what happens is this norm gets weaker. So you go from being universally criticized in the U.N. and in regional bodies and by the U.S. and by Europeans to American, to, to a number of governments deciding that there are other things that they value. And so with the war on terror, the norms around coup making get weaker. And there's some countries where we will criticize coups, like in Fiji, and there are other countries where we won't criticize a coup, like Pakistan or Egypt. The, the unscheduled transition of power in Egypt. Right. We will criticize a coup in Gambia, but not much less so in, in Niger and in Chad. And this happens because 
There are competing priorities, first the war on terror and then great power competition. It also happens because now you have other options. And so the government of Niger can ask the U.S. government to leave and they can bring in the Russians. Right. They're cooperating much more closely now with the Russians. You can have economic ties with the Chinese, which will fill things in. And so the rise of multipolarity make a difference. So it is both the lack of adherence to the norm, the lack so you know that there's no longer really this automat automaticity to the fact that you're going to have these really severe sanctions and the fact that you have other options. And so if you're Myanmar, well, you're going to get all your aid from China anyway. It doesn't matter. Um, if you're Zimbabwe, you may clear it. There's a rumor that the that the coup in Zimbabwe was cleared ahead of time with the Chinese. The Chinese don't actually always like these coups. They actually would prefer continuity of whatever government is in power. They were getting along very well with the previous Myanmar government. But they will, they're not going to be allergic to military governments, and they're not allergic to coups. Um, and the U.S. government has become a good deal less allergic to coups. And as a result, the norms have eroded. And I think without this international restraint, whatever pressure was there is now showing up as, as full-blown coups again. So coups are the most obvious way that militaries play a role in democratic backsliding across the world. Um, but as I often tell students here, and I'm sure you tell students at the Naval War College, you know, coup versus not coup is sort of the extreme ends of civil military relations. And there are a lot of other ways that military officers play roles in democratic backsliding or erode civilian authority. And, you know, particularly here in the United States, we fight over civilian control without any thought really to the idea that there's going to be a military coup in the United States. Um, so in your perspective and from your research, like how else can and do military actors erode civilian authority and democracy kind of more broadly across the world? What kind of what what do they uh, what roles do they play? Some of the regular bureaucratic push and pull can end up undermining democratic control and civil control. And so the military, because it is a large and complicated bureaucracy, because it is protected by its the high levels of esteem for the military, and because of the secrecy involved in the military, can choose whether it's going to be cooperative with a president or whether it will attempt to bamboozle a president. And there has been, over time, a gradual erosion in the direct control over the military. Um, and it's not just civilian academics who think this. Don Rumsfeld thought this when he came into office with George W. Bush. This is in Mike Desch's book. He planned to fire a bunch of generals. He had a bowl on his desk. He said he put, I think it was $100. Uh, I'll put a $100 bill in here any time I say anything nice about a general. He was concerned in the year 2000 about the extent to which the military was behaving in ways that was not in response to the the leadership. And I think that it got a lot worse during the war on terror. Um, if you look at the Afghanistan papers, there's a good deal of people blowing smoke upwards, overestimating or or selling an overly rosy story about how well they're succeeding. And it compounds as you go upwards. And it's not just the uniform military there. It's also the U.S. government that's doing this in an effort to, to sell a vision to the American people of success, which doesn't match what's on the ground. But the problem with that is that the less that there's transparency and accountability, the bigger the problems of civil military relations become. And this is one that I think a lot of military officers disagree with int intrinsically because they say we're supposed to be, it's not secretive, but we're supposed to be secret. There's a lot of this stuff which is supposed to be classified. But I think that a culture which is against transparency can really cause a lot of damage in the long term. So are there things that democracy-loving military officers can do 
um, that ensure a lot of this erosion doesn't happen? I will give you a very civilian answer, which is to say, I think at the end of the day, the values which matter most are the values, are the civic values of the nation, and that any democracy has to rest first and foremost on accountability, and that you can't have accountability without transparency, and that we need to make sure that we keep this in mind as much as possible in all aspects of the U.S. government. And I think if if we fail to embrace those values, we are doing ourselves as a nation a disservice in the long term. All right. This about ends our time here. But if you would like to know more about the U.S. Army War College's Civil Military Relations Center and our programming, you can find us at cmrc.armywarcollege.edu. I also want to thank you, Dr. Singh, for your time and insights into what will certainly continue to be an important conversation across both the United States, its military, and our partners and allies across the world. And thank you to all of you for listening into our series on modern civil military relations. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and subscribe to A Better Peace so that you don't have to miss an episode, and then rate the podcast on your podcatcher of choice so that we can grow our community. So until next time, from the War Room, I'm Carrie Lee. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.